Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the second of our double bill of shows today. And it dovetails nicely the show we are doing now with the one we did earlier because it kind of follows on chronologically. And having looked at the German side with the wonderful David Stahl this morning, we're now looking at the uh, Soviet Red Army side, kind of what came next. If you didn't watch the earlier show, it was a masterclass in, in just how to deliver history by uh, Professor David Stahl. We talked about the retreat from Moscow and, and his conclusions about that. By the way, folks, if you are new to the channel, don't forget to click like when you're watching something. Leave us a comment. Consider becoming a patron or a YouTube member and spread the word about what we're doing here. We are still gaining viewers. It has slumped a little bit recently, but it's still the trend is upwards. But anyway, thank you for those of us joining us today. And one of the things you know I'm really keen on is bringing people in to the, as guests who are on a lower rung of the ladder than some of the other guests. David Stahl, of course, renowned worldwide, multiple books about the Eastern Front. We've had the Peter Caddick Adams and the John McManuses and the James, James Hollands, those kind of people. But I also delight in giving people who are lower on the rung, but they're going to go as high as these people. They're opportunity to speak about the subjects they are interested in. So with that in mind, today's guest, Ben Claremont, has been looking at the Red Army. He's uh, working on the PhD and doing that and war and strategy and is currently waiting in the wings to come in and talk to us. So I'll bring him in now. So good afternoon, Ben. How are you? Good afternoon. Good evening. Um, time zone dependent. I, I'm doing quite well. Good. Um, so, Sorry. you know, we, we, we were talking before we went live there about, mm -hmm. you know, we, I always just uh, like to bring people in who are who are on the earlier rung. But, you know, you must be in your, when you were studying and still studying, a lot of people do focus on the the, the Western Front. It's D-Day, it's Market Garden, it's yes. like that. Or it's, if you're American, it's the Pacific and Midway and Iwo Jima. Mm -hmm. What drew you to the Eastern Front? Was it always the Eastern Front from a young age or was it something kind of shifted into halfway up? I've... I've sort of always been fascinated by World War II. My grandfather was on a Fletcher class destroyer, right. um, Evans DD five five two, in the Pacific, um, and so and my grandmother was a RAF radar operator um, during the Battle of Britain down at Beachy Head, and so I always, growing up, was in immersed in this context of World War II, um, and. Of course, the the sort of the big Western narratives of of the bomber offensive of um, of the Pacific of the the Atlantic and and the Northwest European and the African and Italian campaigns were sort of v very present. But from quite a young age, I was always interested in in the Soviet fight, um, in part because you know, like I picked up books uh, like Red Storm Rising. It, probably somewhat of a young age um, and, and read them and looked at that and went, well, well, why did they get that way? Um, and so to sort of understand why they, what they were doing in the 1980s, you have, to, you, you sort of start tending towards looking back at what they were doing in the, in the 1940s. Um, and because that was the big war that actually happened. Um, and so just the scope there's something sort of almost like the sublime about the immense scope of it. It's, it's too big for any one person to really comprehend uh, in even a lifetime uh, in its totality. But by, by sort of, you know, the, the iterative work of, of thousands of people trying to understand it uh, uh, very much appeals to me. And the fact that it is still in many ways, there are fundamental unsettled questions about it. Like it's great to a great way to start an argument is trying to ask is is asking people how many casualties there were, um, because it's it's I mean fundamentally I would say it's probably unknowable. We'll, we'll never have a good estimate or or, um, or or a good solid number. We'll have estimates, um, but you know like this is and this is something that uh, Charles Dick brought up in his comparative history of the uh, Western Allied and Soviet offensives uh in the summer of 1944 which is i think a wonderful two volume work but um in the one for the western allies he could do uh for all of the major operational sequences an analysis of the personalities and decision making from the army group army and down to the core level and even sometimes to look at divisional commanders whereas when he's discussing the soviet operational sequences in the summer of 1944 
if he wanted to do that, he would have to be covering something like 350 people. Yeah. So it's just such, it is such an immense scope and it contains within it sort of the, the, some of the most violent and, and, um, and cataclysmic expressions of, of modern warfare that, that we've ever seen. Um, and so it is, it is ripe for, for analysis and, and for really understanding what war is and means, um, both in the sort of academic, like, Ooh, I like moving, um, you know, moving little map flaggies around, around a table, but also in the fact that it is just visceral trauma on a, a continental scale inflicted on millions. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just well, that's a good it, point. And interestingly, whenever I do an Eastern Front show and casualties come up, there'll always be at least one or two comments saying that whichever source the guest historian mm -hmm. used, they were using the wrong one. I mean, whichever yep. yeah, that way that always is yep. the standard thing. Who I can't possibly take the word of someone who uses source A because source right. B the is Germans the, great one. Are, the next show, no. it'll be it's source C that's the great one, but anyway, they'll say the, the Germans are cooking about, their books, the Soviets are cooking their books, everyone's lying, nobody died. Exactly. So the um, point is, we're going to be talking today about, you know, deep battle, deep operations. And yes. it's one of those, those expressions that, like Blitzkrieg, I think, mm -hmm. have been reevaluated several times over the last seven to eight decades. And, and yes. we're going to get essentially your version of what these things mean. So you've got a PowerPoint. You're in control of it. Yes. We'll bring it up on screen. Folks, um, we'll kind of do, I think, with the detail we're covering Ben's going to cover most things. We'll do probably questions towards the end. If there's something specific that comes up, please fire away. And of course, I'll put your comments up on on screen. But Ben, yep. I'm going to hand over to you to kind of just take us through what your 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 thesis is. Great. Um, so uh, this the title I went with is "Sharpening the Spear" because we're focusing, we're looking at Soviet um, the evolution of of Soviet um, operational art and tactics through the lens of the Ford Detachment, which is. Um, really the, the sign you that links, uh, tactics, um, to operational art. Um, and I'll get into defining tactics, operational art and strategy and how they're related in a second. Um, but the, the sort of the reason for taking this perspective is because even ignoring strategy, you know, here are the two, here are the two go-to books to, uh, to discuss the evolution of of these tactics and operational art is, you know, one for each volume in world war two. And, uh, you know, they're, oh, they're hold them up so we can see the covers. Oh, yes. so you might as it's, well. Uh, these are, it's David glances. Soviet yeah. conduct to tactical maneuver and Soviet military operational art. Um, and these are, these are translation, not quite just translations. They're, um, sort of an adaptation of, of a, a number of, of very high caliber Soviet works, but they are incredibly dense and, of course, for such a sprawling, um, for such a sprawling military system as the Soviets, um, it would be too much to practically cover the whole the whole uh, gamut. And there's also there's still relatively poor um, documentation and and information out for Soviet um, development at the at the sort of micro tactical level of like the section squad fire team platoon and company um and and that continues up to up to you know um the the late soviet era in terms of poorly covered in the sources at least the sources that have have been available um so that's definitely some interesting room but anyway so let's get into terms and conditions so the ford detachment that we're talking about today uh, is the uh, Peridovi, uh, Peridovi Otriad. Um, we're just going to say Ford Detachment. Um, it's a reinforced tank or motor rifle or naval infantry or marine uh, subunit or unit assigned to solve independent particular missions in the course of a battle or operation, which is a lot of jargon to say that it is a task-organized um, tactical formation. Um, so uh, a, pardon me, um, a battalion, a, a, a reinforced battalion or, or brigade um, or regiment that is assigned to a particular battlefield mission in support of its higher, um, uh, higher headquarters. And that particular mission is designed to enable the success 
of the higher headquarters, and it is tailored in its attachments and reinforcements to achieving this mission. Um, in terms of the Soviet terminology, they categorize uh, the the units of uh, or the scales of of military unit into four categories. That being the subunit, which is battalion or division, which is a confusing Russian term that means battalion size artillery unit uh, or lower. The unit is the brigade or the regiment. The formation is the division or corps, and the higher formation is army front and theater. And those terms are translation rough translations of the Russian ones. Um, Broadly, I'm going to be work, uh, working off of the, the work of Charles Dick, Alexander Hill, and, and David Glantz here, as well as uh, the Soviet Military Encyclopedia and Soviet Military Encyclopedic Dictionary. Um, so with that out of the way, um, the, the broad structure of this will be that first we'll do uh, the four detachment in the first period of war, that being June 1941 to November 1942, focusing mainly on uh, early in June 1941, because the Ford detachment is a very comp, it's a very challenging thing to to implement um, in terms of what where it stresses the command structures. It requires a lot of coordination and initiative and independence that the Soviet Army was not able to pull off between roughly July 1st, 1941, and November. The Stalingrad counteroffensive, mm -hmm. um, and then we'll dive into the second period of war, uh, where uh, that's November 1942 to 43, and then the third period of war is is the tail end when uh, they make good on the lessons they've learned in the first two periods and have continued uh, um, consistent success or relatively consistent. So, the focus for the Soviets, the thing that they thought was was perhaps most important was operational art and this is a field which they systematized um and that is defined as the the part of military art which is the theory and practice of war covering the theory and practice of preparing for and conducting combined arms uh joint and independent operations by the various types of formations of the armed uh, forces which is a formal way of saying it is um the connective tissue between uh, the tactical battles of uh, divisions and corps and the strategic course of the war. Um, it is what converts success at the tactical level into success in the war. Um, and this is a very important field in uh, sort of making sure that you don't wind up with Pyrrhic victories uh, or or that you you don't fall into the old adage of winning the battles and losing the war right. um it's much more succ succinctly defined by alexander svetchen one of the the early theorists uh as uh, the tactics make the steps from which operational leaps are assembled and strategy points the path that's uh, a nice way to to succinctly put it um it is a fundamentally different field than tactics tactics is much more um it, it's Operational art is sort of an exponential leap in yeah. the uh, 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 geographic and temporal scope of, of what uh, when a commander is concerned about. And so um, it is, in many ways, one of the harder, the harder fields. Um, so the Soviets look at that, having systematized the field and defined what the space that the problem is in. Tukhachevsky comes up with this idea of successive operations, where you can't uh, defeat an entire enemy army in one attack. So you have to uh, successively uh, fight a series of battles. And there is the, the sort of all of the, the accoutrement that, that comes with that's systematized to the 1920s. The Soviets put that into formal doctrine, uh, well, uh, formal um, um, literature with their 1929 field regulations. Uh, and then we have deep battle come out of that. Uh, when they're looking at the technical advances that are happening in the 1920s, uh, some of which they were a little too aggressive on um, in terms of the recoil of systems and universal artillery pieces. But um, to by, by lashing together all these technical advances of modern, uh, modern tanks and artillery that is now much longer ranged, more accurate and larger caliber, and aircraft and... Um, uh, airborne assault, or I should say paratrooper assault, um, the Soviets uh, believe that it 
is now theoretically possible and work to, to make this into practice to simultaneously engage the entire depth of the enemy's tactical defenses. Um, and by simultaneously engaging the, the entire depth of the enemy's tactical defenses, it will much more robustly uh, shatter this defensive, uh, this first sort of uh, zone of defenses um, than having to sort of gnaw through it um, from one side. Uh, so it's sort of like dissolving it from from all directions. Now, just to and, jump in for a second, Ben. Yes, the, the, it all sounds wonderful in practice, but from the Western point of view, planning uh, this type of um, doctrine relies to a certain extent on assuming the enemy, whoever the enemy may be, because in the twenties it's kind of theoretical, although it's obvious mm -hmm. where the directions go. That the that the, the armies you're going to be facing will be doing something based on how they've done it before. And as we kind of know, without going down a massive rabbit hole, the yes. British can't decide on what to do with tanks in the 20s and 30s. We've, talked, we've discussed it on the channel. You know, there's all sorts yes. of directions they can go with, their, with, with tanks. And the USA isn't sure what to do with air power, isn't sure what to do with it. So this is all great in theory, but it, as we will be find out when World War II begins, mm -hmm. it, it, if your enemy's doing something that you weren't expecting them to do, having an, uh, your own doctrine is 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 not necessarily the solution. Is that a, yes. is that a reasonable uh, point to make? Um, so there's sort of uh, two ways to look at that. And, and one is that um, doctrine in the Western sense is um, more of an intellectual guide than a recipe book. Yeah. It's supposed to, um, it's supposed to sort of shape how one thinks about problems. Um, and this is, the, this conceptual evolution here in the Soviet Union is um, sort of straddles what we would consider um, theory, like a, a non-official doctrine, uh, like a sort of more theoretical stuff, and also what we would consider doctrine. Um, though the the uh, field regulations that it's systematized in are are authoritative. Um, but at the same time, the, what the Soviets are doing is building up a huge intellectual uh, military academic apparatus to um, learn about how to uh, to learn how to think about war um, and to learn how to analyze combat and, and conflict and and learn from those uh, learn from that data. Um, and that is really what is the linchpin to their success in it, to, to turning their failure in 1941 and 42 into success alongside the industrial story is this intellectual story of being able to um, being able to intellectually adapt um, and learn from the mistakes uh, in a relatively quick way. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that um, later in the presentation uh into sort of how quickly they were able to turn these lessons around and disseminate them back to the force but they also did um throughout the war have uh huge issues with officer education because of the very high casualty rate and and the the rapid expansion of the army um the soviets like many armies in world war ii had uh perennial problems with converting competent uh sort of uh battalion brigade and division commanders or regiment uh, as well as brigade um into into uh core and army commanders um and their solution the ford detachment is part of the solution to this in that um its role is on one hand to be the the force that enables op, um, tactical and operational maneuver by lunging ahead of the main body of forces to um to seize key terrain or, or um, interdict enemy reinforcements or uh, uh, tasks like that. Um, but it also means that you're putting, if you're doing it properly, you're putting the most competent subordinate in your organization in charge of a powerful grouping of forces um, and allowing them the independence to uh, achieve the mission that will result in the most possible success while allowing the overall commander to uh, keep a closer eye on the rest of the subordinates. Um, so for it, there is a perspective of looking at it as, um, as the Soviets understanding that they have 
commanders that are very smart and capable of doing these tasks, and then they have commanders who are fine, but maybe not necessarily to the up to the level that you would want to give them as much independence um, or put them out in as risky of a situation. And and sort of their efforts of learning to um, learning to balance using uh, these two different types of forces, the mobile forces and, and what is generally rifle forces, um, is is one of the stories of the Soviet um, military system figuring out how to do war during World yeah. War II. Um, so but that we'll, we'll, let, we'll let you get on with it. I mean, I'm just saying purges have already come up in the side by there about it's all very well with the purges, but I don't want to. Oh, the purges, the purges will come up. Derail you too much. Funnily enough, uh, this guy, Vladimir Triandafilov, uh, I think it's Vladimir, um, Triandafilov, uh, he was actually quite smart in that he managed not to get purged, uh, by dying in a plane crash in 1931. So, <laughs> right. But basically everyone else that you're seeing here got purged. Uh, here is Yegorov. He got shot in 1939, and he was alongside Tukhachevsky, uh, one of the real um, pioneers of deep operations, which is turning, um, turning deep battle to, uh, from a tactical concept into an operational one. Um, and it is... Um, the, the concept of deep operations is that instead of the enemy's defensive system being sort of bashed in by a steamroller, uh, you have these multiple independent uh, penetrations sort of reaching out like fingers, um, shattering and, and, and corroding the enemy's defense, leading back to the main group of forces that is the palm, which is a very weighty group of forces that can batter mm. through the now um, fragmented enemy defense. Um, and the the deep there doesn't reference the overall depth of the penetration, uh, but indeed the length of these sort of fingers reaching out from the main forces. Um, and that's something that is often lost in Western literature is that um, the the key thing that defines deep operations and makes it unique isn't... Um, isn't that it's breaking through and running into the enemy's rear because everyone uh, to one extent or another does that. Um, but these, these sort of finger, like um, finger, like advanced force penetrations of things like forward detachments and at the higher levels, the mobile group, which then in the cold war turns into the operational mobile group or the operational maneuver group. Um, but we're not focusing on that. Um, so this all is systematized in the 1936 field regulations. And the 1936 field regulations are really illuminating as to the uh, intellectual uh, focus of the Soviet army uh, leading into uh, World War II because it's something like 70 or 80% of the book is dedicated to the offensive. Um, so the strategic defensive is basically neglected at this point. The operational and tactical defense are glossed over and everything is about we are going to fight on the offensive we're going to take the fight to the enemy um and we're going to uh we're going to liberate you know uh, insert communist uh you know ideological plethoras here or um but it it is a revolutionary piece of doctrinal literature um it's fairly even ignoring the fact that it it doesn't really focus at all on the defense. Um, it is, it represents a really innovative uh, doctrinal concept that was systematized and authoritatively put into practice by a major world power. Um, and then over the course of the purges, it sort of chips away and, and doesn't, it's, it's a great foundation intellectually, but it's not, there's no um, refinement to it. It doesn't have the sort of practical experience built into it um, that would make it workable in and of itself. And that's one of the problems that the Soviets have in 1941 and that everyone has is taking their, their theory uh, and turning it into actually succeeding on the battlefield. Uh, and the other big issue they have is here's Lev Meklis. He wasn't purged, unfortunately, but stuck around through World War II being annoying and purging people. 
uh, and it's one of the reasons they lost Crimea. Um, but uh, the the purges had a myriad of effects, but the arguably the most fundamentally catastrophic one wasn't shooting all of the officers um, because shooting people like Tukhachevsky was bad. Uh, but the bigger issue was that for four years, it, it insta uh, in installed a, a command climate where no one wanted to take any responsibility because if you took responsibility for something, you died uh, or were sent to Siberia uh, and your teeth were knocked out. Like uh, I want to say Rokosovsky, Rokosovsky and um, what's his name from up in the Leningrad front. Um, oh, mm, yeah. The one who was like quickly purged and unpurged right after the winter war uh, and then wound up commanding yep. in Manchuria. But um, yep. um, but the um, because no one took any responsibility and and everyone was terrified that, you know, they, they would break things. You had situations like where pilots wouldn't go up flying because they didn't want to crash the airplane, even though they didn't have any experience flying the new airplane they were given. Uh, because if they crashed, then that was worse than if they weren't competent at flying the airplane. And the other big issue uh, is that on the eve of World War II, the Soviets, um, like, they weren't stupid. Uh, they looked at what happened in in the fall of France, and the, the broad intellectual reaction in the Soviet military was, oh, shit, we were right. Um, pardon me for swearing. Um, the... So there's a shift back towards uh, organizationally and doctrinally and technically back towards uh, something closer to the 1936 field regulations. Um, but that shift was supposed to have been oh, at a massive rearmament. They were in the middle of rearming, rearming with brand new submachine guns, brand new rifles, uh, a, a quite advanced semi-automatic rifle, the SVT-40, which you can see in that photo. Uh, in the foreground of KG or NKVD border guards um, in what is now somewhere between Belarus and Poland. Um, the uh, brand new aircraft, brand new tanks, all sorts of brand new equipment was flushing into the force. And the commanders were all getting promoted upwards because, and this is in part because of the purges and in part because the force was being rapidly expanded. They were very quietly mobilizing reservists. Um, and so by the goal was that the Soviet army would be ready uh, to deal with uh, the, at that point, understood to be inevitable German offensive um, by uh, 1942, sometime mid-1942. Um, and if you look at what their equipment and their doctrine was and how long the Soviet officers would have been in command of the units they were in command of at that point, yeah, they probably would have been pretty ready by 1942. But in, in mid 1941, uh, almost no Soviet officers anywhere in their command structure from like, you know, company commanders all the way up to marshals of the Soviet Union had been commanding the same sized formation the year before. So everyone's new at their jobs. And there's a lot of uncertainty as to as to what they're doing. Everyone's been shuffled around between different units. So these these command relationships haven't had the time to develop. And as a result, we have a cataclysm in 1941. Um, so we get Barbarossa. And uh, I know David Stahel uh, in the talk previously today was talking a lot about the fighting in 1941. Um, and so in a, in a somewhat interesting twist, I'm not going to talk uh, at all about the Battle of Moscow, um, but indeed in a, a small action, let me just remember where on the map it is, right? I don't know if you can see my mouse. Um, no, because the mouse has done work on StreamYard now. Got but, it. Um, is there just describe where you're pointing. Got it. Um, oh, wrong way. Uh, so right where it says 1st Panzer Group, uh, between 1st Panzer Group and 17 uh, Army, there's that label says 6 and Southwestern Front. That is the vicinity of Lviv in Poland, or in, well, it was Lvov in Ukraine and then Lviv in the Soviet Union, and now it's Lviv in Ukraine. Um, but we're talking about that area, right around uh, Lviv and the Battle of Brody, where you have 8th, 9th, and 19th Mechanized Corps um, fighting quite cogently. Um, we're going to focus mostly on 9th Mechanized Corps um, because 
Ninth Mechanized Corps is a very interesting formation. They have very competent leadership. Their commanding officer is Konstantin Rokossovsky. Um, their chief of staff is A.G. Maslov, and the division commanders are Emi Katsikov, N.A. Novikov, and N.V. Kalinin. So these are all people who would go on to you know, widespread acclaim and competence throughout the rest of the war. Um, some of the cream of the crop of the Soviet army. And um, let's see, uh, can I, do I have, is the map next? Yes. Um, so, and here we have the map of, of that situation. Um, and it's sort of messy because it's not color coded, but uh, you can see, ba, 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 bum. There we go. Uh, so there's 9th MC, that's 9th Mechanized Corps, and then you have 35 and 20 TD coming out from that, as well as 40 TD, and you have an arrow pointing out from those and things labeled FD, and those are the forward detachments. Um, and what's really interesting is that in this engagement against, um, what is that, uh, 29th Panzer Corps and uh, I think, what is that, 55th? Anyway. Um, yeah, looks like it. The... Uh, the four detachments do their jobs, you know, by the book and succeed. Um, but the Soviet army at this point uh, does not have the command and control infrastructure, the communications infrastructure, the coordination between arms and between branches and between parent and subordinate units, the logistics infrastructure or effective combined arms coordination to make good on those. So the four detachments very successfully go ahead. They seize river crossings, they seize key terrain, they preempt German reserves, and then the following forces of the uh, tank divisions are unable to make good on those on those gains. Um, even when these units are being commanded by the best Soviet officers, some of the best Soviet officers around. Um, and so fundamentally, the... The issue here is is not necessarily that the concept is invalid, but that the Soviets are unable to make uh, effective use of the concepts that they have elaborated. Um, and the um, the tank battles here around the area of Dubno and Brody um, and Lviv are absolutely massive it's there's something like four thousand tanks swirling around in this area it's it's you know this is this is when people want to point to like giant ridiculous tank battles this is where you point to um there's uh rakasovsky and i believe that is katukov but it might be maslov um i think it's katukov um both photos from later in the war but um so as a result, the, the Soviet units here are annihilated. The commanders and staffs manage to get out, and then some portion of the soldiers, you know, aren't uh, uh, imprisoned or killed. But um, the, the situation is not ideal. Uh, and these battles are, um, you know, in late June, and the, so the Ford Detachment functionally ceases to be um, a, a thing that the Soviet army uses by early to mid July. And it doesn't really reappear as a systematic, effective organization for about a year. There's a little use of them around Moscow, but it's not very effective. It's not very coordinated. And uh, I, I figured that um, doc, Dr. Professor Stahel would, uh, would be focusing on Moscow and I didn't want to uh, regurgitate Moscow. Interestingly enough, in that photo, by the way, you can see a T-35 heavy tank there that has been absolutely blown into little pieces. Um, the yeah. That's one of the... I, I'm focusing mostly on, on doctrinal and conceptual development and, and, and theory and practice here, but um, that is one of the, the sort of the technical changeovers that's happening in this period, is that the Soviet army is completely re-equipping all of its heavy tank units and medium tank units and light tank units. Um, with new vehicles. And so even though the Soviets have something like 20,000 tanks um, at the start of the war, and and on a on a technical level, they're largely, uh, in terms of the, the hard statistics of mobility and firepower and and kind of armor, uh, broadly, they're they're better than the German ones. Um, they lack the sort of key, uh, key things like radios at all levels of command um that will that enable effective coordination and the the other advantage the germans have here is meth 
um, in that it's it's really frustrating, I would imagine, to be fighting an enemy who, even though their leg infantry does not need to sleep for potentially a couple days at a time because they're mass issuing stimulants. And um, and this was a huge issue in the fall of France. And I, I would be I would not be surprised uh, to uh, if if one looked into it to to see that it was a huge issue uh, for the Russians and the Soviets, I should say, um, mm-hmm. in Barbarossa. Um, and like it's it's honestly a pretty sensible thing to do. Like we modern military still issue stimulants, just not methamphetamine. Um, okay. So so yeah, the lessons learned here are are pretty pretty much that the Soviet army can't do the things that it it wants to. Um, so just to, just to recap, because you know you have a yeah, sip of water sorry. as well. That they they kind of understand at this point that the principle has merit, but they're yes. not quite up. To work, I mean, I was going to mention if you hadn't mentioned radios, I was going to mention radios yeah. because whenever Guderian comes in in the German Blitzkrieg and people say he's a, he's a masterful use of of uh, of armor, I always say it's his masterful use of communications that makes yes. him good at that, not yes. so much the use of armor. And it's all very well having a great idea, but this kind of forward penetration, forward units, you need to have good uh, navigation, good communication, and be able to exploit yes. that. And it seems to me that the the, the tip of the spear has those qualities, but as you get towards the back, the information hasn't filtered through, the training hasn't gone through, the quality of officers isn't right. there, and frankly, the technology and the kit isn't up there to, to, to reach the level they want. Right. The the Soviets have a, a lot of really good industrial concerns. Um, a lot of their heavy industry that they built up in the 1920s and 30s is excellently built. Uh, because they hired the guy who built Detroit, Albert Kahn, uh, to to design their factories and to to educate their industrial architects. Um, but they don't have the same sort of um, large advanced electronics industry um, to produce uh, large volumes of things like radios. And the the radios that they do produce aren't aren't particularly excellent um even later in the war um certainly not to the standards of the u.s army uh of the time which was frankly absurd um mm. uh in its in its um in its it's both quality and quantity of, of radio communications and that's probably one of the great benefits but they had lend lease so they could they could grab radios like that um but no most soviet tactical communications of their between armored uh commanders and and subunits at like sort of the platoon and company level were at this point still with signal flags um which isn't very useful uh especially if you're getting shot at um yeah. and the uh the radios that they did have tended to be especially um they tended to be a lot of receive only and the commanders would have two way radios and uh, there weren't great links between um, between levels of command. And and yeah, fundamentally, the the Soviets also didn't know. Um, th- they had a lot of problems knowing when they went too far out of out of um, support of, of higher echelon units um, and and stuff like that. Uh, even even into far later in the war, as we'll see, um, and they tended to substitute similarly to the Germans, but from a different cultural background. They they tended to substitute um, personal initiative, which generally um, filtered down into aggression and stubbornness. Um, when when all else failed, there was sort of a feeling of well, just figure it out, just go do do it. You know, put. Uh, set your shoulders, put your nose to the grindstone, and shove, and the you know you'll figure it out. Which isn't very productive when the Germans are just more tactically competent than you at this point in the war. Um, they had excellent artillery, but the coordination with the artillery wasn't there uh, to uh, to make good on that. And also, they ha- still had huge issues where their artillery park wasn't really uh, particularly self-propelled at this point in the war. Um, and certainly wouldn't be until far later in the war. Uh, so they had uh, the artillery had massive issues keeping up with tanks uh, because sure on longer distance movements you put the gun on the gun tractor and tow it, but if your artillery is moving about the battlefield, it's moving at the speed of push, which is not suitable for tanks. Um, 
so that's that sort of rounds out this vignette from very early in the war yep. and um we then get to the second period of the war um this is i believe around the stalingrad counter offensive. of this photo here but i'm not 100 percent on that because i grabbed that photo a while ago um so we get to uh the the Mos or the the Stalingrad counteroffensive, um, which is fun to call the sequence of the gods because it's Uranus, Mars, and Saturn. Um, and there are there is the use of four detachments here, but it's it's quite limited. Um here around the Stalingrad counteroffensives, we have four detachment use by uh the tank corps in fifth tank army and uh the mechanized corps over from either side to uh to do the envelopment and then also uh to raid tatan sky airfield which has um popped up uh it's it's one of the more prominent things in the literature uh over here um and and a few other a few other uses but they're not pervasive and they're only somewhat successful um there's a a, a fair amount of instances of um units that were supposed to form four detachments in in theory not doing so because they just don't have the tanks they don't have the coordination and the soviet army really doesn't have they've they've rebuilt to an extent after the the just destruction the wholesale destruction of the military in 1941 over the course of 1942 uh but they haven't really gotten back to the point where um where they could have these very mobile combined arms subunits uh, and units that are commanded by an aggressive, intelligent, uh, independently minded, and not needing supervision commander um, that wouldn't uh, that that are uh, agile enough that they won't get hammered by a German counterattack, uh, which is one of the big issues. Um, so. Uh, Oh, that's up in the north. Um, so, for example, here is uh, the four detachments from fourth, seventeenth, uh, then later fourth guards tank corps in December of nineteen forty-two, um, and you can see uh, the four detachments are the second down from the top in the march columns uh, behind the recce group. The text is kind of uh, sorry uh, behind third down behind the recce group and the movement protection detachment, um, and. The text is kind of not great, so uh, I've I've put the labels off to the side, and you can see that uh, it is it consists of a tank brigade, uh, or sorry, it consists of a tank company, a rifle company, and then a, an engineering and mining company, which is is not particularly strong, and it's very light on infantry. Um, so if you think about that, it's, you know, twelve to sixteen tanks and a hundred and thirty infantrymen um riding on the tanks so you're in a situation where um as part of the forward detachment's mission typically it's to seize some sort of key terrain or or um be that be that a, a river crossing or a, a choke point or uh or def uh, a terrain where the enemy is likely to to put uh reserves through or or defend on and the um the a company of tanks and a company of infantry is not enough combat power to do that if the germans show up with anything meaningful especially because these are expected to be somewhere in the order of over 10 kilometers ahead of the main body of forces in the brigade um and the there's also not really enough infantry if they have to go into an urban area or even just a, a relatively large town uh to screen the tanks and this is uh this issue of being too light on infantry is is something of a perennial one uh, for when the so the Soviets and the Russians bungle reforms, which they've done a couple times. Is that there's a tendency to forget that tanks are very vulnerable without infantry screens, especially in urban areas, um, for various cultural reasons uh, regarding not putting enough emphasis on urban combat or or trying to avoid it. Um, and so there's instances where these tank units, the, these four detachments just, you know, will run into a bunch of lightly equipped infantry, even, you know, uh, uh, sort of the Axis allies or, or what have you, the minor Axis powers uh, dug into a town and they have severe issues um, 
severe issues breaking into that town. Now, the 67th Tank Brigade uh, does have a much more, uh, a much larger Ford detachment in that it's a tank battalion, light one company, and an anti tank troop with an engineering company as well. But that's, again, very light on infantry. Um, so they have the capability to drive around very quickly. But at this point of the war, the Soviets don't really have the protected mobility um, infrastructure and, and sort of uh, equipment to have uh, effective infantry support for the armor in the depth um, continuously. And there's also issues of logistical support as well. Um, and this continues, this pattern continues through the, the spring 1943 counteroffensives um, following on from Stalingrad where the the soviets will often have uh not just four detachments but mobile groups which is sort of the uh the the operational scale uh sort of core and army sized uh big brother of the four detachment that's doing a very similar job but at a, at a far larger scale um where they outrun their logistics and then they get hammered by the germans and this is what happens uh around uh kharkiv in uh in 1943 is that the soviets are um too strung out too light on infantry they've suffered too many mechanical losses that they weren't able to flush back into the advancing units and uh they're low on logistical lift and so they've been caught out on a string and they get hammered and um and not just at, at sort of battalion or brigade scale but but at core and army scale um so the soviets the lessons that they learn in this period are that um, the Ford detachment works conceptually and they, they can put it into practice, but it needs refinement in, in their practice of it. They need to, um, they, uh, um, they need to strengthen them. They have to be more properly organized and closely coordinated with their commanding forces. Um, they can't be hastily formed or poorly structured. That was one of the biggest takeaways here is that if you, if you skimp on the preparations for this, if you, if you just sort of wing it and, and try and, and improvise a Ford detachment uh, from scratch, it's not effective. It, it's, it doesn't really get anything done and you stand a very good chance of getting, you know, maybe a fifth to a third of your force just killed um, because these are very high risk, very high reward units. And just to jump in, Ben, mm -hmm. we're, we're already challenging some of the, the preconceptions I think even some of the viewers have and, and mm -hmm. I have had in the past of the Red Army being a very blunt instrument that just doesn't learn from its mistakes, doesn't even do any kind of thinking or self-criticism. It just keeps throwing men and material and everything until it wins. That that's that still gets repeated. I always say yes. to people I, before a show, I always try and do bad research as well as good research. And I try and mm. find the, the sort of the internet articles that say, you know, the Red Army was just throwing men in. You know, you're saying that yep. they recognize there's a, there's issues with this, but they're going to keep refining it, keep adapting it. One question I wanted to ask you, by this stage, by 42, 43, obviously they've been in, at war with the Germans or the Axis for a, a couple of years now. Are they taking any influence with their forward units from from the camp group that we the Germans use? Because it's there's a there's a it's not a complete level comparison, but there is a there is one you can observe about the Germans and their camp group in particular counterattacking action, or, or are they mm. sort of sticking with how they want it to work and not adapting to the German way? So, I would uh i would argue that it is an example of convergent evolution i think that right. um the, these kinds of roles um especially as well on the defensive uh the forward detachment has a huge screening role um that gets kind of exercised around stalingrad but not very well and i skipped over because of, of focus and time constraints um but I think that there are a number of, of similar units, uh, unit types in various militaries around the world um, that have convergently evolved to look relatively similar. I would say that um, off the top of my head, these would be things like the, the German Kampfgruppe, the Ford Detachment, and uh, uh, American uh, Armored Cavalry. Um, so like American, uh, core and, and divisional armored cavalry units are 
fully combined arms, um, you know, heavy mechanized units that have uh, a good balance of armor and infantry and their own organic artillery and later air power. Um, and, and in World War II had uh, on-call dedicated air power. Uh, I think I'd have to double check my history of, tact of Ninth Tactile Air Command for that. But um, because they serve similar roles of screening the force from counterattack and and sort of lunging out to to uh, be these sorts of um, advanced forces and what have you. Um, I don't think that there was uh, an intellectual cross pollination um, between what the Germans were doing and the Soviets were doing because um, they both had ideas about this sort of thing before the war. Um, the Germans, I, I personally would would uh, tend to fall more towards the the camp of, of saying that the Germans are are iterating well, and and most militaries in World War II, I would say, are are iterating on what they were thinking about before the war and adjusting it to better understand the the conditions uh, that they're experiencing. I don't think there's, uh, I wouldn't say that there are particularly many wholly novel, um, wholly novel innovations in terms of um, um, theory and practice of war uh, in various militaries in World War II, um, maybe in the naval theater, but we're not talking about that today. Um, because the the people who are doing the thinking about how to innovate on this are have have professional education equivalent generally to postgraduate degrees in their fields and they've been working at this you know if you are a a, a brigade or a divisional commander um in world war 2 well in the German army, certainly, um, but uh, and less so in the American, the Soviet, and the British army because they expanded so much. Um, but there is a, a good chance that you have um, a you've been educated from a certain a certain perspective and a certain outlook of uh, how war is conducted, how to fight, and and how to think about how to fight. Um, in the U.S., you have the Leavenworth School, which is very much um, focused on uh, amassing an overwhelming force and just crushing the enemy before you. Um, the you look at um, the sort of the post D-Day plans that were made before the landings, and they essentially call for for just that amassing an overwhelming force uh, logistically and 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 in terms of infantry and armor and artillery and uh, pounding the Germans into sand and just moving forwards consistently, never letting the Germans, nev never letting up on pressure until the enemy shatters. Yeah. Um, whereas, the, uh, whereas the Soviets have, their background is much more in the sort of freewheeling, very relatively quite low force density, highly mobile combat of the Russian Civil War. Um, and and arguably, uh, when in certain situations, uh, the, the the Imperial Russians in World War One, um, and and what have you, so their views of their views of how war is conducted are are very much shaped by um, a similar operational environment to the Germans of um, large scale maneuver, um, but whereas the Germans are looking at it from the perspective of Central and Western Europe, where there's relatively smaller spaces in logistics, the Soviets are looking at this from the perspective of the Soviet Union and, and sort of uh, Central and Eastern Europe, where you have um, a lot more, uh, a lot, a lot larger of an area to work yeah. over, and so you have to think about and and even maybe plan for your forces coming out of contact with each other where you can't maintain a consistent logistical line uh from your supply bases all the way up to the leading battalions and brigades of your of your offensive and so maybe looking at that you you sit down and come up with these ideas of how to turn that into an advantage of formulate these forces so that they are self-sustaining for a period of time and send them on a mission uh, within their self-sustaining reach, 
um, generally still within the, the range of air cover and, and such, uh, to accomplish objectives for the, the higher command. Um, so to answer the question in, in far fewer words than that, I would say I don't, I wouldn't, I don't believe there's, there's anything that I've seen that would show that this is a cross pollination from the camp group. I think it is largely, um, largely convergent evolution. Um, okay. Well, we'll, we'll carry on. If people are loving it. There's loads of comments coming, which is great. Good and, to hear. um, let's keep on going. Yep. So. So you have these big spring offensives, which all sort of peter out around the end of March 1943. And the Soviets then sit down at uh, in this sort of lull in combat from March 1943 until the Battle of Kursk. Uh, and they think very hard about what they have learned from these winter and early spring counteroffensives and the use of Ford and, and, and what we're looking at today, the use of Ford detachments. And they they come away with the the conclusions that four detachments must be strong they must have uh, organic infantry support um they have to be properly organized coordination has to be worked out beforehand they have to have a clear chain of command up and down to their higher uh, commands and to the supporting assets that they are that are, are pre-designated to support them in terms of especially air power they have to have um co uh, competent logistical lift uh, so that their logistical situation doesn't become untenable. And that they can result in uh, markedly higher rates of advance when properly implemented, not just for tank units, uh, the, the mobile forces, the tank and the mechanized units, um, but also for rifle forces. Um, and one of the biggest turning points we see, or not turning points, that's a silly phrase, but uh, one of the biggest changes we see at this point uh, is that the four detachment concept starts to be applied to mobile forces or, or to rifle forces because rifle divisions now are getting logistical lift. So where in 1942, uh, 41 and 42, largely the Soviet infantrymen, like so many thousands of, uh, of years of infantrymen before him, got around at the speed of walk and his best friend was a shovel. Um, now they have trucks. So it's becoming possible... Um, and we'll see that uh, later on. Um, it is becoming possible to have a forward detachment from an infantry unit, say, of, uh, of reinforced battalion, infantry battalion scope that uh, can achieve, um, achieve a forward detachment's missions because it's truck mounted and it can actually uh, maneuver. It can, uh, once the infantry unit has, has, uh, completed a breakthrough of the tactical defenses, it can be sort of squirted through that gap um, and go accomplish its missions. Um, one of the big issues with the implementation of the forward detachment uh, that we're going to get into uh, in the post curse counteroffensives and and even into 1944 um, is that the um, the forward detachment often had to be committed. Uh, before the breakthrough was complete, and this was this was not good. Um, the forward detachment is supposed to be this really high speed, uh, you know, very sort of almost elite in terms of as as elite as mainline units can get um, force who are are inserted in its totality uh, behind. Uh, the sort of main tactical depth of the enemy's defense to go do missions to destabilize it further. So if they have to expend, and they're relatively small and fragile, um, so if they have to expend combat power and lives and take attrition, helping the, the rifle forces break through the defenses um, and can't cleanly get through um, because the, the attack of the rifle forces is failing for various reasons, or flagging at least, um, the uh, the forward detachments can often often go off half cocked. Um, they're the because of the attrition they take, they're less able to effectively um, do their roles, which means that there's less of connective tissue to turn this tactical success into operational success, and so the the offensive tends to stumble. And um, if you are in a like a single front uh, offensive, and something like this happens, 
you you can have quite big issues um, where there is no there is no one to take the Germans' attention away, um, and then the Soviets have to over the course of 1943 and 44 figure out uh, how to how to shift the Germans' attention away from a flagging offensive. Um, and uh, let's see. So, yes. So now we come to Belgorod, Kharkov, um, Kharkiv, uh, which is a very prescient and relevant thing to look at today because the Russians just tried it again with the same units. It was really startling to see 4th Guards tank army back at Belgorod attacking mm -hmm. to Kharkiv um, uh, a couple weeks ago. But I guess it, they're not being that imaginative. Um, but, um, or sorry, Fourth Guards Tank Division. Um, I think, yeah. Um, but at Belgorod, Kharkiv, um, you have. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Oh, no, that's the race of the Never. Sorry. At Belgorod, Kharkiv, uh, you have uh, First Guards Tank Army effectively forming four detachments that were able to. Uh, successfully maneuver around Kharkiv. Um, so they're able to destabilize the German defenses at Kharkiv. Um, but then the Germans come in and counterattack these units, and they're mauled. They're mauled pretty badly in the counterattacks. Um, again, because one of the biggest issues with the Ford detachment is that uh, these are relatively small. So if you have even a reinforced tank brigade that has run out uh, and is is holding a crossroads or a river crossing or uh, a promontory or what have you, um, some, some tactically significant terrain, and the Germans show up with a tank division, even a 1940, December 1943, or, or sorry, uh, June 1943, July 1943, uh, you know, not, not nearly actually division strength tank division, that can be significantly challenging. Um, and so even though they're able to successfully um even though they're able to successfully complete their mission they're taking they're taking quite bad losses to these sorts of tip of the spear units where they're putting their best trained manpower which is not ideal um and the now belgorod kharkov is successful um and the the next sort of phase of the operation is the the uh, race to the Nepper, as Dave Glantz calls it, um, where you have the Soviets figuring out uh, a a very clever use of um, a clever use of something that they called a forward detachment, which isn't really a forward detachment, but it's it's close, and that is uh, Fifth Guards Tank Army, which uh, was mauled at Kharkov, uh, Kharkiv. Um, scrapes itself together into roughly a tank brigade, a reinforced tank brigade, which should give you a, a, a sort of a sign of how badly they were mauled, that an army is is now a brigade, not even a corps. Oh. Um, but they have all of the command and control equipment and the radios uh, of the three corps that were subordinate to 5th Guards Tank Army. So what they do is, as a deception measure, they're inserted as a Ford detachment and go uh, running around uh you know chattering on the radios using using all of fifth guards tank army's code words and such that the germans were aware of um and so the germans think that they're a tank corps or a tank army and three tank corps uh in a tank army uh in the depths of their defenses and and they wrong foot the germans quite effectively so we're starting to see the idea of using a forward detachment um as or something approximating a Ford detachment specifically as a deception a deceptive force because also to an extent the germans have have gotten an idea of what the Ford detachment is right now because not just the soviets are learning the germans every time the soviets come up with a a new a new tactic the germans will eventually come up with a counter tactic um the the easiest example in the breakthrough is that the soviets you know they preceded their breakthroughs with massive artillery fire the germans started figuring out that if they pull back uh, when the artillery fire happens, uh, or, or if they get intelligence, there's going to be a breakthrough. They can pull back to the second line of defensive trenches, uh, while the artillery is hammering the first line, and then they can run back out to the first line while the Soviets in the gap between the Soviet artillery lifting and the Soviet infantry arriving. Um, the Soviets then start sending reconnaissance battalions in to go fight in the trenches 
before the artillery uh, shows up. And and there's a whole back and forth of tactic and counter tactic in a in a wonderful dialectical cycle um, of of just battalion level infantry breakthroughs of defended positions. But um, in this period of the post Kursk period, so this the ba- the back half of 1943, uh, Army Ford detachment this, at this point are reinforced tank brigades, um, which is much larger than what we saw in in 1941, where they were two companies, uh, an infantry and a tank company. So the Ford detachment has increased in size in part because the Soviets are able to coordinate um, a a tank brigade in the depths with a lot of attached units. Um, This this system puts a lot of stress on staff work. Um, The the battalion and brigade level staffs that are getting all of these units attached to them are running into you know if they're not on top of their game in terms of staff work the coordination falls apart and that's something that is a perennial problem with the soviet military is effective coordination um especially because they have uh, this culture where there's not a lot of trust in junior commanders because on one hand the system is relatively rigid compared to uh, certainly the germans um somewhat the americans and the british the system is relatively rigid and so the commanders are, are higher commanders are less willing to trust their subordinates to do things properly because there have been a lot of incompetence. Um, just be, on a on a sheer statistical scale, uh, you know, there's there's been a lot of uh, by this point of the war, a lot of people just promoted up the ranks because their command, you know, the people above them died or because they they merited that, but that couldn't hack it. Um, and and also there's just sort of a, a structural structural um unwillingness to to let the subordinates off the leash uh for for cultural reasons uh, in the soviet union um but the um the four detachments sort of sort of uh buck against this trend um and the they're they're able to be quite effective in raising to the Dnieper. They are the the elements of these Soviet forces that actually seize and hold the bridgeheads over the Dnieper, um, which are critical, especially around Kiev. Um, they are they are critical in um, allowing the Soviets to uh, cross the Dnieper. The Dnieper is a huge river. Um, I didn't think to bring a slide of it and. It's kind of challenging in part to do so to get an idea of what it was like in World War II because the Soviets built five massive hydroelectric dams. Yeah, all the dams have screwed it all up now, haven't they? Yeah. yeah. So now instead of now instead of being like uh, what like uh, three kilometers wide, two kilometers wide, now it's like ten, seven, ten kilometers wide uh, for most of its course in Ukraine. But back then, it still was more than a kilometer wide for out throughout most of its run. It's it's not nearly as wide as the Volga, but it's huge. I mean, and it makes so, the Rhine look like a, a stream, doesn't it? I mean, right, like, you know, it's, right. it, it, it's it's huge. Yeah, it is. It is this massive watershed that the other thing about it is for most of its course, the Western Bank has a big bluff on it. So if you are the Soviets trying to cross the Dnieper, you have to both keep in mind that you have to uh, paddle your way on a boat across the river um, while being fired at by the Germans. And then when you get off, you have to climb maybe a hundred meter, uh, you know, three hundred foot bluff, um, maybe fifty meters if you're lucky. But you still have to uh, assault up that obstacle. Um, whereas by seizing bridgeheads over the river, by having these four detachments get there before the Germans can fall back fast enough um, and hold those bridgeheads over the river, uh, the Soviets have a toehold that they're able to not have to do assault crossings. Um, which they did, they had to do assault crossings over the Don, and that was a mess. Um, the other thing that they have here uh, on the Dnieper, which doesn't get a lot of press in the West, is, is uh, gunboat flotillas. So mm-hmm. the Soviet Navy has river gunboats going up and down the river, which a lot of them are surprisingly armored. Like, a lot of older tank turrets wind up, uh, you know, if the tank's hull is knocked out but the turret's okay, they pull the, the turret off and put it on a, t- uh, on a boat. And so you have a tank uh, or a, a boat going around with like all sorts of auto cannons and heavy machine guns and two tank turrets uh, to engage German river defenses um, and provide fire support. 
Um, but the either way, crossing a river, you want to do a crossing administratively. You don't an opposed crossing of a river is a terrifying mess that generally results in everyone dying. Um, and we see this at Stalingrad when the Soviets are crossing the river, even when the Germans don't have, you know, the Germans don't hold most of the, you know, even, even though they have a beachhead on the, on the Stalingrad side, crossing the Volga, you know, they're under fire from German artillery and air, and it causes a lot of casualties. Um, so by, by having these four detachments able to bounce rivers and, in many cases, they they getting the four detachment across the river was was either often a function of um, audacity. Uh, in one case, uh, in ni- late 1942, early 1943, a battalion of sized four detachment, uh, I believe this was in the counteroffensive out of Stalingrad, um, managed to cross a a bridge held by the Germans at night by they turned their uh, their headlights on on the tanks. And uh, just sort of, you know, got up out of the hatch and just ran across it at full speed. And the German sort of sentries at the bridge were too dumbfounded to realize that they were Soviet tanks and not German tanks. And so they managed to cross the river and seize the bridge. Um, and that sort of thing happened like a couple times. Uh, so, so you're talking about very ballsy commanders um, that the Soviets are putting at the head of these four detachments. Um, in other cases, they would be crossing these rivers with, with wooden rafts made on, uh, you know, on site, um, or trying to find, uh, sort of ferries from the area. Um, and so the, but, but by seizing the river crossings, they are really enabling not just the, the tactical success or even the operational success, but this is, is setting the stage for the strategic success um, of the next offensive. Because the Soviets are now able not just to think about, uh, in their, their commanders are not just thinking about um, their ability to successfully pull off uh, the offensive they're in the process of doing, but they're thinking about, okay, how do I do that? And then set the stage to enable the next one to start smoothly. Um, And seizing the next river boundary that they run up to is uh, a textbook thing that is, is one of these missions the Soviets are very concerned about because in this region, um, the major rivers, which usually run North South for the majority of their course um, Mm -hmm. are the dominating terrain feature. There aren't, until you get to the Carpathians, and even then you can go north of them, uh, between sort of the Carpathians and the Baltic, there's not a lot of, of terrain that is uh, impassable other than water obstacles. These massive rivers like uh, the Vistula, the Oder, the Dnepr, the Don, um, the Boog, the northern end, southern or western. Um, and And so... That's one of the things they focus on. And bridging becomes, uh, bridging has sort of perennially been a concern for the Soviet military or the Russian military. Uh, you know, the the bridging over the Ra- or over the Seine in 1815, if memory serves, was, uh, that was Russian, uh, Imperial Russian bridge, um, bridge engineers who, who forced the Seine. And so um, it comes up, it comes up a lot. It's, it's a hobby of mine. I, I'm very, I, I'm weird that I love bridges. So anyway, that, that rounds out 1943. Um, by the end of 1943, the Soviet four detachments um, were, were functioning pretty well. Um, they, they operated as subordinates of the front's mobile group. So each front had a ta- generally a tank army functioning as, as, as its mobile group, which would engage in uh, operational deep maneuvers. Um, i.e. separated from the main body of forces in the enemy's uh, depths uh, by some distance to facilitate the goals of the overall operation. The the tank army would then form a, a mobile group of a separate mobile corps or mechanized corps who would initiate operational exploitation uh, and enable the mission of the uh, tank army, uh, the, the front's mobile group. And then the mobile group itself nested down another layer uh, would have four detachments that would lead the march of the tank and the mechanized corps 
And their missions were broadly at this point to initiate meeting engagements, that is a, a battle where both sides are attacking from the march, um, by preempting enemy defenses, seizing advantageous deployment locations for the main forces. Uh, they would also, uh, in extremis, help complete the penetration of the enemy's rear area defenses. They would lead the exploitation and, and uh, key, they would lead the pursuit. And they would also, uh, as mentioned previously in that large diatribe, uh, conduct river crossings uh, in the enemy's defense. Um, and these missions weren't novel, um, but the previous Soviet theory and practice, you know, you can find these missions all over the place, but it was the experiences of the winter of 1942 and 1943, uh, the Soviet counteroffensives then that allowed them to refine the theory of uh, the Ford detachment that they sort of haltingly employed in the beginning, the first half of the year into effective practice ish in the second half of 1943. Um, and one of the big enablers of this was the, the strengthening in the technical base of the Soviet military. Um, so it allowed the, the four detachments to be formed at division and at core level. Um, and it allowed them to have much better logistical lift and mobility and, and what have you. HGW Davy has some great articles on uh, the, core, the tank corps and the tank army's um, logistics. And it's really interesting how they're using a mix of rail and horses still uh, and trucks to effectively supply these forces uh, that are detached from the main body of forces and its logistical lift. Um, however, in this period, the, the Soviet practice was still unable to quite fully make good on their theory. In particular, at this point, the Soviets hadn't refined the key indices of, of use or the norms for the forward detachment such as those that would define the precise composition of them, sort of a, a standardized task organization of like, here's the default that deals with most situations okay, and then you work from there. Um, they hadn't uh, worked out the best configurations for them, how to adapt these organizations to the mission, the enemy, the terrain, the troops, the time, and, and conditions. Um, the appropriate depth for these missions, so there were still a lot of instances in the tail end of 1943 of the Soviet four detachments outrunning their logistical train and being caught out by the Germans. Um, the proper separation between them and the main body of forces, how, how, what is the best balance of not being so far that you're not able to be supported by your, your higher headquarters, but not so close that you're not really being a forward detachment. You're not getting the benefit of, of, um, of that depth behind the German, uh, defenders. And, uh, then the the number uh, of four detachments that would be formed at the different levels of command, uh, as well as the lateral distance between the four detachments of a parent unit and the logistical support, again, was hadn't fully been worked out. So though the theory had been refined, there was a process of learning to convert it to practice uh, fr from battlefield experience. And each of these lessons had to be paid in blood. But the Soviets were iterating on their theory and on their practice. And so they would learn from each successive either operation or group of operations um, generally. Uh, well, institutionally, they would learn from them. Um, certainly, some some officers took the wrong lessons, as we'll see in a second, um, Konyov. But um, the there was still a process of further refinement before it would reach the sort of ultimate, ex, um, uh, uh, not expiration, uh, ultimate uh expression of yeah. of the concept in world war ii um and that brings us to the third period of war which it says uh well december 43 to january 44 until the end of the war um and here we have uh, i believe this is in uh, uh east prussia uh we have uh, a, a bunch of uh, soviet uh, self-propelled uh, su-76 uh self-propelled artillery pieces um so the first the first uh, big offensive we have in the fourth period of war is the, uh, and we're not focusing on the Leningrad counteroffensive, uh, is uh, in the south, and it is the Zhidomir Berdichev uh, uh, offensive, which is part of the Dnieper Carpathian strategic offensive operation. Um, and Zhidomir Berdichev is is quite important because in this offensive, here's a picture from it. Um, notice the nice white paint because they remembered that it's snowing. Um, is uh, that the four detachments proved crucial in destabilizing um, the German defenses of Zhidomir. And they were able, 
Uh, unlike earlier, where often the four detachments would be mauled so badly that they and potentially their parent units were not combat effective um, after uh, after tr trying to hold their objectives and and often succeeding at holding their objectives, but they couldn't they couldn't do anything else after that. Um, in the Jutomir Berdichev offensive, the four detachments were strong enough and and well organized enough, uh, and the coordination with their parent units was was such that. They were able to destabilize the defense of Zhidomir and hold on to the defensive much more resiliently against the uh, the German counterattack um, around Zhidomir. Um, and we can see, uh, we have that little map there from 4th Guard's tank corps on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, showing the, uh, the use of these four detachments. Um, uh, generally, the, the battalions are generally the four detachments there, um, the TBN listings. Um, so a fourth guards tank corps here is functioning as the army mobile group. Um, and they are using brigade sized four detachments, which in and of themselves are deploying their own battalion sized four detachments, uh, to affect operational maneuver and, and destabilize the enemy's defense. Um, so the, the four detachment here is, is used effectively. They've solved the problems that they ran into uh not even you know uh not even uh, two or three months earlier uh, at the end of september of 1943 um so here we can see the the sort of time scale that the soviets are able to turn around these relatively complex uh theoretical and practical issues uh and learn from their experiences is in the order of of two to three months um they're able to to sit down retrain people put out um Put out uh, new instructions and 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 materials uh, to demonstrate the the effective use of uh, a new, more reinforced, larger forward detachment, um, and implement that within three months, which is pretty impressive. It's not quite as um, there's faster turnarounds for some of the artillery work in the summer of '44 um, in the breakthrough, um, but that's much more a mathematical, you know, a uh, problem of like apply this many tons of artillery shells to this many hectares and you break through. Um, so it's easier to, to shift that around. Um, so Zhidomir Berdichev is, is, sets the stage for uh, what we then have uh, in the summer of 1944, which is the big Soviet offensives that get all of the press. But I'm not going to talk about uh, Bagration because everyone knows a lot about Bagration. And... I think Lvov Sandomir is much more interesting uh, in terms of the use of the Ford detachment, um, as well as the fact that we've now gone from Lvov in uh, June of 1941 all the way back uh, to Stalingrad, and now we're back at Lvov. So I think there's sort of a nice, uh, it wraps things up nicely. Yep. Um, so uh, this is part of the Belarusian strategic events of operation. Um, Lvov Sandomir's is down there if you see on that map there's fourth tank corps um and it label it's labeled uh with leilashenko um it's right uh, down below what is that uh 13th panzer something uh, in box sector um that is that is the sort of the area between there and uh and um the the down there where it says 38 moskalenko um it's it's Konyev's first Ukrainian fronts offensive, um, and it it is uh, on the wing the the sort of the southern wing of Bagration, um, though uh, yeah. So it it is very interesting because it sets the stage where Bagration destroys a huge portion of the German military. Um, I think it's it's and it, it's very you know impressive and and everyone likes to talk about it because of that um what lvov sandomir's does is it opens the door for the next phase of offensive operations which is the vistula odor offensive that takes the soviets to within 60 kilometers of berlin um so even though it's it's not getting uh quite the same press because there's not as big numbers and it's smaller and in a bottom corner of the front and has it, it, there's some stumbles to it um it is uh it is it is crucial in its own right it's not just sort of a, a flanking clearing operation um 
so here's here's a closer map of Lvov Sandomir or Lviv Sandomir, um, depending on what languages you want to put everything in, because everything could either be in German, Polish, Russian, or Ukrainian. Um, and you can see, uh, if you look closely at this map, there are several major rivers that uh, bifurcate this uh, this area. There's the Dniester uh, down in the south underneath, uh, uh, well, by where that says Sambor, um, and then running down in the south towards Chernovtsi. There's the Western Boog, which runs north-south um, down along the... the um, down along the the front of the advance where the soviets will have to cross that at some point uh generally relatively shallow in their penetration so it's not it's not uh so close that they are penetrating as part of the breakthrough because they uh and and so would be able to bring up engineering assets for that they have to cross that from the march in the exploitation um then you have the san which we'll see in a second is a really annoying river to cross um, because of the geography of it uh, in that area. And then finally, you have the Vistula, which is the ultimate sort of goal of this. Um, and that's over by Sandomir in the upper uh, left-hand corner. You have the Vistula, which is the crossing that is the upper, or, or is the ultimate goal of this, because that puts you uh, on a course to break into Poland. Um, and the... It's, I believe, Sandomir is something like under 200 miles. Um, so would that be like under 300-ish, 350 kilometers from um, from uh, either Krakow or I think it's Krakow, not Warsaw. Um, oh no, it's it's uh, Warsaw. But anyway, um, it's the major river that bifurcates the middle of Poland, and and it it isn't quite as large as the the Dnieper or the Volga or the Don. But it is a major water obstacle that needs to be crossed. And the front line, uh, as we move back towards Germany, the front line is contracting. Um, they don't have the same sort of, of length to cover. And so they are able to increase, in theory, the density of their forces. And, and so it was very important for, to the Soviets to establish a major important bridgehead over the river. And four detachments would be crucial in doing that. Um, the other the other thing that we haven't been talking about them because that's a whole other like very long discussion uh that we see here is the cavalry mechanized group um which is a core sized or army sized uh formation well the group is an army sized and a cavalry mechanized core would be a a, a core sized formation that performs a similar mission to the forward detachment or the mobile group um except that instead of having uh, some sort of mobile infantry, be that uh, truck mounted or, or tank riders or what have you, uh, they have, uh, I guess what you would call dragoons, um, they have mounted, in, uh, mounted infantry. Um, and they are surprisingly successful throughout the war, um, sort of in general, though there's several times where uh, the commands get shot out from under them and they have to infiltrate back into friendly lines on foot alongside paratroopers but they're they're a particular feature of the the soviets in world war ii and i think uh went to a fair way in demonstrating that that mounted infantry were still relatively viable in this period um if you didn't have enough trucks uh to to move them around um which is just sort of a fascinating anachronism there's a very a very notable one in the Mongolian strategic offensive or Manchurian strategic offensive operation, which is the Soviet Mongolian cavalry mechanized corps, uh, where Isa Pliev, who was a very politically reliable, but also quite competent cavalry commander of these uh, units in, in was put uh, in command of a mixed group of, of Soviet tanks and Mongolian uh, horse infantry. So you, you, and they advanced something like 40 or 60 kilometers a day on average for 10 days uh, during that uh, uh, action. So that's sort of like the last gasp of the Mongolian, uh, the Mongolian sort of horse riding uh, armies, um, which I think is, is very interesting, uh, mm -hmm. but is also only tangentially related to what we're talking about. So anyway, Lvov Sandomir's. Here's the rivers. Um, clockwise from the top left, we have the Vistula, uh, 
you can see it's it's pretty wide, not crazy wide, but it's kind of fast flowing and it is um it is not not in all the bridges are out of town, which means the Germans can dig into the town and even if you can get over the bridge, you then have to get into the town and fight through that and that's very bloody. Um then you have the Dniester, the Dniester um which has so that is looking um north-ish. So the right-hand bank is the one with the bluff, the the one that the Soviets are attacking from, but it's still there's there's relatively high terrain on on the sides of it and uh it's relatively wide and there's there's okay fords but they're not it's not ideal um it's still another major river that you have to cross uh then you have uh, underneath that the western boog which uh the big issue that is it has if i'm remembering correctly um is that the uh it's very marshy all around the river. So you, even though the river is relatively shallow and, and all right, there's, there's just a mess to get to the river from stable ground, especially if you're trying to get a tank across, you basically have to bridge over the marsh too, um, or do a corduroy road or something. And then finally we have the San, which you can't see it great from that photo because I had a devil of a time finding good photo, but there's a, a 300 meter bluff on the uh german held uh east uh, western bank of that river so that's a hell of a crossing to try and do from the march um and there's no good fords um so the soviets had to figure out how to cross all of these rivers without ha uh without the germans being able to effectively defend them um when these are the main the main terrain features that the Germans know they will need to defend by this point of the war. The Germans, you know, they started learning how to do these sorts of dug in defenses in 1914, 1915, 1916. They're very good at building a dug in positional defense that is going to be miserable to get through. And frankly, like this is, this is one of the reasons they rack up huge, uh, hugely imbalanced casualty figures is because, uh, you know, Hans and Franz in a dug-in machine gun nest uh, have a lot easier of a time uh, inflicting casualties on, on the enemy uh, than trying to uh, assault that machine gun nest when it's worked into a, a functioning defensive position with overlapping fields of fire, infantry, and artillery support. Um, so, and, and this is something the Western Allies found out as well in, uh, in the Bocage, yeah. where you just have a terrible attrition. Um, I'm just thinking, Ben, just to let, let you have a break for your voice for a couple of mm -hmm. seconds, is that we talked about it both with David Starr, we talked about it with Prip Buttar mm -hmm. a few weeks ago. We all tend to look at those, you've even used them tonight, those, those maps of the entire Russian, from north up mm -hmm. in Leningrad, right the way down to the, the Red Sea. And of course, on those kind of maps, you can't see rivers. I mean, you, you, you really. Whereas if yeah. you're looking at the German army pushing towards Berlin or across the Rhine, you can see the Rhine there. It's... Mm -hmm. We're, we're struggling because of the scale of the of the Eastern Front to realize that there are these massive great rivers there. And I, was, I said in a sidebar, uh, I had a friendly discussion with someone last week about, he said the Russians never had to do, or Soviets never had to do amphibious landing. And they go, well, they kind of did, really, because as you're making the point here, mm -hmm. these rivers are, in a sense, you have to do amphibious landing to cross it because you've got to make a bridgehead. You've got to get, you, you can't get all your troops across in one go. Yep. That's exactly the same as getting across the channel or getting into Italy or Sicily or Torch. Or, so... I the, think we're all guilty a bit of, of of not really seeing the Eastern Front in in small with a small enough map to understand mm -hmm. these physical obstacles, and therefore this comes up to this idea of the forward detachments and and why they would be so crucial. Yeah, um, and I will say just to sort of um, because Soviet amphibious landings is is one thing I do have a bit of a bit of background in. Um, they did do a number of amphibious landings, um, most notably. Um, in uh in the sort of krasnodar nova kerchask region on the black sea and then across the kerch strait into crimea um as well as up in norway um the they certainly were not amphibious landings in the the sort of um western allied uh view of them because the there's fund there the fundamental difference between the Anglo-American plurality of the Western allies and the Soviets is that the, 
the U.S. and the, the British are both insular powers. Fun Sorry. Functionally. Um, and the Soviets are a continental power. So whereas the, the U.S. and the British, if they want to invade somewhere, have to build an entire invasion force and put that all across the water obstacle... Um, and support that on the other side across, be that across the Atlantic for torch or across the channel. Um, the Soviets, when they look at amphibious warfare, it is always, it, it's more like, um, it's, it's more like, a, a parachute, how, how the Western allies would look at a parachute landing. It's putting a group of forces in the enemy's rear, um, in support of a, of a larger offensive. Um, and the so it's never like the main focus of of everything and and uh it's just a fundamentally different perspective um but an interesting one and one that maybe would be should be talked about on its own uh and not sort of you know ramshackled in here so in Lvov Sandemir's now that we have a little background on on the sort of terrain um um in Olvav Sandomir's, um, the the guy in charge is Ivan Konyev, uh, and Konyev is a very very much symbolic of the the command culture in the Soviet military. Uh, in that, there's a lot of push to just sort of get it done, and and you know if you can't figure out a clever way to solve the problem, put your shoulders down, nose to the grindstone, and just muscle through it. Um, and a lot of a lot of emphasis on uh, on speed. Um, everything had to be happening faster because the Soviets uh, the Soviets came to the conclusion that that the most important factor was uh, was speed, and that if you advance fast enough and destabilize the enemy fast enough, um, the the enemy. Uh, can't form a, co a coherent defense as they're falling back. And so success propagates itself. And, and with their experiences of doing all of these breakthroughs, uh, they were willing to basically sacrifice and expend every other resource they could to not have to do more breakthroughs. Like imagine, I mean, and it's an understandable conclusion. Imagine what the allied allies would think of if, if they had to break out of the Bocage five or six times uh, in the course of the Normandy campaign. And suffer all of those casualties. Um, so Konyev uh, inserts the four detachments. Um, is this it? Uh, yes, Konyev uh, inserts the four detachment, and and they later say that it's um, that it was kind of a deception plan. But Konyev inserts the four detachment early, um, before the breakthrough is completed, and the Germans figure out that this is what's happening, and the army can't follow through the four detachment doesn't meet it much success but the but it attracts the german reserves so konyev gets the idea to take the bulk of first guard's tank army and shift it um fairly far south i, I can't remember the scale but it's something like 100 kilometers south uh to the other end of the offensive and smash it through there uh or, uh, through the already completed breach and now that the German reserves are moving away from that area, they would be free um, to to follow that up, which is part of um, it's it's uh, a demonstration of a Soviet axiom, which is that the best assistance to a uh, to a unit in distress is the uh, headlong advance and successful advance of its uh, uh, of its neighbors. Um, that 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 is how you relieve uh, and assist uh, uh, a a struggling unit. It's not through throwing more resources at it, but it's through throwing more success behind the successful stuff, and then people will be focused on the success. Um, the uh, a, and and we also have some issues of inflexibility here, in that once first guards tank, uh, once the four detachment for first guards tank army, first guards tank brigade is committed they're committed um and there's some grumbling from the from the uh well that's that's more in Lublin breast but um they're still having issues with inflexibility especially uh among 
um, the sort of the non uh, mobile commanders. And uh, and Konyev is, really did have this this like I have a timetable. We're going to stick to it. Um, the the other sort of uh, interesting thing we have here. There's the map gone. There we go. Um, is is uh, Third Guards Tank Army used their Ford detachment to deceive the Germans uh, in this manner, um, or or in in a similar manner to uh, what had been done previously, uh, expanding and sort of refining the use of a of a Ford detachment deceptively um, to draw in German and counterattack forces. Um, and again, uh, the Ford detachments of uh, and mobile groups in general were instrumental in in crossing the Vistula. Um, and and completing the Lviv Sandomir's uh, operation uh, successfully, which set the stage for Vistula Odor, which is basically like a, a textbook example of of what a Soviet offensive should look like. Um, more so than Bagration, like if you want just the the sort of template, not template, but you know that that's the one to look for, and that was set up by Lviv Sandomir's. Um, so. Here's here's just uh, you know the four detachment composition in that uh, in that you have now we can see that the the rifle corps and the rifle units have four detachments. This is sort of winding down towards conclusions. Um, in that uh, you know we now have truck mounted infantry as uh, four detachments for rifle units, uh, and we now have uh, a brigade sized four detachment for the tank corps, which has uh, Two to three companies of infantry, along with the tank brigade and self-propelled artillery, et cetera, et cetera. So they're now much more robust combined arms formations. Um, and generally, uh, and and the Soviets would iterate this throughout the rest of the war. Um, this is really quite early in '44, um, but or, or not early in '44, uh, but uh, throughout '45 they would iterate on this and and improve it, especially in Manchuria. Um, there's there's a uh, or a picture I should say of uh, you know the sort of ferries that they would need to get a tank across the Vistula, um, and I believe that is crossing the Vistula. So you can see, it's no simple task. Um, and here we have uh, this is this is the sort of conclusions we're going to talk about. Um, but this picture is from the Manchurian Strategic Offensive, uh, where the the Soviets were able to implement all of their theory. Uh, in a in a very effective manner um but it's a story for another day um so the four detachments were able to by by 1943 by mid 19 or by mid 1944 early mid 1944 able to be used effectively at all levels uh, of command and and the mobile groups as well um and they were able to form that connective tissue between tactical and operational uh units to enhance and and push the success upwards uh because uh tactics operation and strategy are all all interconnected and interdependent um so they were a very effective tool to enable operational maneuver on the other hand they were also effective as a high risk high reward way to put the most competent subordinates you have who need the least supervision in the place where they can have the most effect while the parent commander uh, keeps the keeps their uh, sort of resources and and uh, attention on the maybe not as capable and not as uh, independent mm -hmm. subordinates. Um, so it's it's it is a uh, one of those one of those neat little things uh, that shows both the successes and the limitations of the Soviet army. Um, and. Uh, I hope that uh, I hope that everyone found it, uh, you know, somewhat illuminating. Um, yeah, no, definitely. I think, I think that's I mean, everything. I mean, I'm yeah, I'm I mean, good to move into questions. My, my conclusions are is that you know I, I learned a lot from this. Partly is that is that you know we we alluded to the idea of the combat command and the, the mm. modern system, and we you know there's the cavalry groups who talked about yep. the American cavalry groups who talked about them yep. in World War Two TV in the past. You know, I think there's there'll be people watching this who don't really haven't really thought of the Red Army as being the instigators of some of this technology. We think of this kind of thing coming more from the US and perhaps the yeah. British to a certain extent. So that that's kind of pretty pretty revolutionary. Um, the other thing is, you know, just is I think this idea that 
it's not very Soviet. Now, what I mean by that is, you know, we think about those propaganda films made in the in even mm-hmm. the Stalin era, post World War II, about the Great Patriotic War and, mm-hmm. and the movies. It was very much the people's war. It's volume. Everybody's mm-hmm. equal. Everybody's part of it. This idea, this four detachment, like a single thrust of I don't want to use the word elite, but kind of better than average troops, isn't very. It doesn't it's, sit with the ideology they're trying to promote. Does that make sense? It is. Um... I would, I would, yeah, I mean, so under Stalin, it's uh, in terms of the, the, the hagiography of the war, uh, the Ford detachment wasn't really, uh, wasn't really talked up um, because it is this sort of niche kind of wonky military technical thing um, that the, uh, so like it's pretty prominent in the literature. Uh, in the in the military academic literature for military professionals, um, but in the in the popular literature, it's it's far less far less uh, uh, talked up, um, especially because it's not really a standing type of unit. It's not a tank corps. It's it's this ad hoc thing that got sort of glued together. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's I would say that that I. It is definitely uh, goes against sort of a, a very basic propaganda view of of Soviet ideology. Um, it's not it, it it was never sort of done away with because it was seen as politically questionable. But it, mm. it's certain well, uh, it certainly sort of fluctuated in its prominence. Um, it it went away for a bit in the in the nineteen fifties, sixties, and seventies because of nuclear weapons. Um, Yeah, I mean, we'll just do a couple of questions because um, mm-hmm. then we'll bring it in. So, Richard Severin is asking: Is were Soviet penal battalions ever part of the four detachments or no. the declared minefields? No, not not to my uh, not to my knowledge at all. Um, the I yeah, I don't believe so. Um, I know we had we had earlier is um, were the four detachments generally getting the more advanced weaponry, the better the better equipment, or, or was that kind of a bit hit and miss? Um, it would depend on when, um, yeah. the Ford detachments, bec- if it, it also would depend on who's Ford detachment, um, because these weren't standing units. These were formed for a combat, uh, a combat action, uh, by other, by, by actual units. So if you were a rifle brigade in 1942 and some, and you were told to form a Ford detachment, you might not have anything more than a bunch of dudes with Mosin Nagants and some, some Maxim guns. Um, but if you're uh, if you're a a uh, mobile group in uh, Manchuria in 1945, you might have a full suite of you know Lendley scout cars and Shermans and and uh, all sorts of of nice things, uh, radios out the wazoo and all. Um, so it really would depend on on who and where. Um, they did often because they were predominantly a product of the mobile forces. They um, probably on balance would have had um would have would have had uh relatively more equipment uh i don't know if better is the right word but certainly right. um yeah okay and we'll make this the last one from ian mm-hmm. car and it was was there any nkvd uh, involvement in this i'd have to go double check um through how the nkvd and smirsh uh conducted themselves um their at the beginning of the war probably i mean it depends on what you mean by involvement like there would be the normal like um you know th- there would be the normal deputy commander for political affairs um who was part of the staff at the battalion and brigade level i think battalion um there would be a counter espionage unit who would be nkvd um in terms of of whether that meant that there was dual command uh broadly no um Hmm. the the question of of single versus dual command is is sort of a more expansive topic but um outside of 1941 broadly speaking the soviets uh maintained a position of single command where the commander of the unit's decision was the commander of the unit's decision and the there weren't any uh you know the there weren't any political officers or whatever that could countermand them um and the political officer uh had, had 
there's a lot to unpack in terms of in terms of their role but generally uh no there were nkvd units like nkvd divisions and stuff i i would have to double check if they ever formed four detachments i don't think so but yeah well, I think to be honest, we will leave it there. It's been really good, and people, mm -hmm. have, uh, there were multiple people have said we'll have you back in the future, so we'll do that. And clearly, there yep. needs to be some more work done specifically on the four detachments, and we're all hoping mm -hmm. it's going to be you. Basically, is is what, what well, is the collective we'll, uh, 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 suggestion? Yeah, I mean, I you know, there's I have a big list of things to write. Uh, I don't want to, you know, I can neither confirm nor deny the contents of said list, but uh, it's definitely an interest of mine, and there hasn't been too much. Um, there hasn't really been anything written specifically on it in terms of a book in a while. So, um, and it's certainly not one that, that, uh, you know, uh, has, has takes advantage of, of the archival sources that have come to mm -hmm. light, um, since, uh, uh, since the, the mid 1990s. Right. So there's definitely room for, for revision probably. Well, I'm just going to remind people what we got coming tomorrow, then I'll come back and say goodbye in a mm -hmm. second. So, folks, we have a connecting show, really. Um, Voin Mostrovich is going to join us tomorrow from the US. Uh, he's a Ukrainian over there, and he's going to be talking about the second and third Ukrainian fronts, and particularly not just the military aspect of it, but what the Red Army officers called military violations. So deserting, looting, assaulting, genocides, all those kind of things. That would be an interesting aspect, so I'm looking forward to that show. Then we follow that up the day after with Susan Grunewald talking about German POWs, and then we have a final show on Saturday about Polish resistance uh, throughout World War II. So that is the conclusion of Eastern Front Week on Saturday. And then next week we have a week of shows about kind of raids and operations, including a couple that didn't actually happen but nevertheless were planned. So keep an eye on YouTube for what we have coming up. But right now, I'm going to bring um, uh, Ben back in to say good, good, thank you and good night, basically. And it's been brilliant. So yep. um, I hope you enjoyed it. And we will have you back another time. So I look there forward we go. To it. So thank this you very is much. Paul for World War II TV saying, I will see you all again next time. Thanks, everybody, for your attention. Bye.